All right. Psalm 133. The Bible reads, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Lord God, I pray that you would anoint my message today, Lord. Uh, you know how I've prepared, Lord, but uh, if, if you need to take the reins and change the sermon or, or do what you will, please have liberty to do so. Well, thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Together in unity, together in unity is what I want to talk about. And this verse states right outright that it's, it's pleasant, it's good, it's wonderful for brethren to dwell in unity. Brethren here is referring to, of course, saved people. We know that carries throughout the scriptures. Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Why? Because we have the same Father. So when you often hear the, the Bible referring to brethren, yes, there is by extension a sibling or somebody who's the same by birth. But we take this to mean those that are siblings of the Most High God. Siblings of Father. And the Father wants all brethren sisters included, to dwell in unity together. In Psalm 133, that, that example is set forth that it is good and it is pleasant that this be so. He talks first about precious ointment is the comparison. Then also the dew of Hermon. And I want to focus in on those a little bit more as we go. But this idea of, of being in unity is one that goes from far and wide of the Bible. If you want to keep your finger there, you can turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and in verse 9, this wisdom of Solomon comes forth. It says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And the threefold cord is not quickly broken. Solomon here talks about how when you're alone, you're vulnerable. When you're alone, you have not warmth. When you're alone, when you fall, the only one that's going to pick you up is yourself. And therefore, it is very important in this life that you would have the two. I think this context is referring to partially about the marriage relationship, where a, a, a man and a woman come together as one flesh. And then as it says down at the end of uh, verse 12, it says, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. In other words, husband wife come together the child comes after and now it's a threefold cord intertwined that's even stronger than the two that is better than the one regardless of what the context means we see that one is not the best one is not good if he's alone when he falleth he hath not another to pick him up if he's lying alone he hath not warmth and in these, these Canadian winters in the summer times, I don't know if you've ever camped out with your, with your buddies in the tent, but when you're by yourself in your tent, you're, you're freezing to death. But you pack three or four of your buddies in there, and you all get the sleeping bags, and then the heat that billows around it. It's a, it's a, it's a lot warmer. It's a lot more comfortable of a situation, right? <clears throat> and this is the example that's given. When you're alone, you're cold. When you're alone, you fall, and you're only going to pick yourself up. Two is always better than one. And so how much more... In the unity of the church is it good when you have many? Acts chapter 2, the Bible says this. In Acts chapter 2, we know this as the, the, the verse in the, the portion of Scripture when, when the church started to come to its fullness. And when the church was launched and kicked off by the Lord Jesus Christ, His death, burial, resurrection, His return to them in His resurrected body, and His giving to them the orders and the commands that came forward, we saw... They had great unity. So, when you have unity, when you have togetherness, 
within a group, whether it's one, or whether it's two together, or the threefold cord that's not either easily broken, or the 15 to 20 of us that gather here together, it's important that we dwell as brethren and sisters in unity. Amen. The early church had this. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So they're continuing this steadfastly. They are sure, they are firm that they're going to remain in this manner. And the manner is doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread, enjoying food together and in prayers. And fear, verse 43, came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Within the context of the new church that had just been kicked off by the resurrected Lord, that had the power of God by His Spirit abiding upon them and within them, the first thing that you found with them is that pleasing, that good unity that was described back in the context of Psalm 133. They continued steadfastly. It says, here's some key words, together, common, one accord, singleness of heart. And then he says, the Lord added to the church. There's a singleness. There's, there's a unity there found within that early church as they are with one accord, as they are common, as they have that singleness in their endeavors. So back in 133 of the Psalms, the 133rd Psalm, you find that it is both good and pleasant for them to dwell together in unity. That's what it says in verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren for brethren to dwell together in unity. And I would tell you that just as it was to Acts chapter 2, the beginnings of the church 2,000 years ago, and just as good as it was before that in the time of David as he penned this psalm, it is still today pleasant and good in the eyes of the Lord that brethren dwell together in unity. Well, what's it like? Look at verse 2. It is like precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard. It is like this precious ointment. This idea of it being precious, we know to be of great value. It is something that is not to be wasted. It is something that is to be carefully used. Something that is precious is not easy to come by because it is, it is not very readily accessible. It is valuable. This ointment is very costly, and it's a very costly sacrifice to be presented at this time of the anointing of Aaron, as we see in this context. We know that when Mary broke the alabaster box of ointment upon the feet of the Lord Jesus and anointed him, he said, it is good work that she hath done, for she hath anointed my body for the burying. The apostles and the disciples at the time looked at that as some sort of great waste. But we see it not to be a waste. Rather, we see it to be an outward expression that there is a precious thing being sacrificed, being used, being offered at this time. And this is the comparison of unity. It is just like that precious ointment and it is to be used in the same fashion. Given, used up, not carelessly, not wasted, but given in precious quantities at the right time in the right place great value then shown upon its use. And Jesus was well pleased when this offering happened. And I say that here in Psalm 133, the same activity is happening whereby something that is precious and very valuable is used appropriately. Here the anointing oil is upon the high priest Aaron. The Bible says that it was upon his head. Then it ran down into his beard, even Aaron's beard, went down to the skirts of his garment. So it went down to the edge of his coat, really. And as it ran down, the image of how pleasant unity is unto God was given its fullness. What does that mean? Well, it means that there was no expense spared. It was, it was of great cost, but the use was fit. 
And unity costs you something. And we'll see that a little bit more as we go. Unity isn't something that just happens. Unity requires a certain amount of sacrifice within the brethren. But that's what happened. We see that this does not give, go to great waste. And though there is much of it because we see that it overflows. It comes off the head, down the beard, onto the coats of the garment. They did not spare of that precious ointment when they anointed Aaron at that time. And even so, we ought not spare in our sacrifice as we seek to dwell together in unity. At Pentecost, we saw, yes, they were with one accord. They were gathered together in that upper room. We saw that at the beginning of chapter 2. And what happened? They were in obedience to God. They were dwelling together in unity. And when that happened, the oil fell upon them. Many times in the scripture, you'll find the oil as a type of the Holy Spirit. And in that same way, I think we're seeing Aaron being anointed upon him, the Spirit coming upon him in a type. And then we saw that same thing come forth on the church at that time. Again, we're just highlighting the fact that unity is not something that is just for a specific time. It transcends time. God is pleased. God finds it good when he sees brethren dwelling in unity at all times. Right? Think of Cain and Abel. God would have been pleased to see those brethren dwell in unity. And yet they, they broke away from that because one's works were righteous and the others were not. And they found strife in that situation. The next it is like, the next example that you see describing the unity of brethren together is the dew of Hermon. And as that dew descended upon the Mount of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. So we saw the blessing beyond offered when that precious ointment was given. What we see here in the second example, I believe, is provision, just daily provision. The Bible says that unity brings about that provision. It was the same type that we saw when the Holy Spirit came down upon them, that when they were together, they were given what they needed that was fit for the ministry and what was expected as it was promised. Genesis chapter 27 and verse 28 says, God gave thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty. And it continues. So the dew of heaven was given, the fatness of earth, and plenty of it. And that was a gift of God, bountiful in its presentation. Exodus chapter 16 and verse 14 says, When the dew that lay was gone up, continues on and says, There lay a small round thing. And if you're familiar with the book of Exodus, you know that that small round thing, little more the size of a coriander seed, was the manna that provided the meat in the desert. They had meat enough where they could go by and each and every day collect it, a double portion before the Sabbath, and that provided for them what we needed. It was within the bountiful dew where this provision was found. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 2, My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew. And so this same idea is being put forth, and I think this is typifying the provision of God being accessible through the unity of brethren dwelling together. And that's good and pleasant. So we see that precious ointment. Those are the blessings beyond. These are the good things that man doesn't necessarily need in their life, but God gives those things anyways. It's, it's, the, it's the power from the Spirit. It's the, it's the abundant life. It's beyond what man desires and what man would need. God gives abundantly to all, above all that we ask or think. And the provision there on the heels of verse 3, the dew that descends, that dew that provides for the manna, that dew that drops his doctrine, that soothes the soul, that feeds the soul, the speech of God distilling as that dew, is the second example we have within this portion of Scripture. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And what you see here is that this same thing, as I tried to highlight, can be applied unto the Christian's life even now. So how do Christians have that good and pleasant unity within the body, you ask? Have a united goal. This is number one. Have a united goal. Unity doesn't come by mistake. Unity doesn't just happen. 
Uh, they had to purpose in the upper room to meet together, to be together for three days, to work together, to struggle together, to pray and to fast and to wait for the promise of his coming for, for as long as it would take for it to arrive. They had to be there on purpose and with a purpose and united in the common goal of seeing the Spirit of God come upon them and receiving that promise that he had. So here as a church, we need to have a united goal. We need to have it set forth exactly what our desire is and and, and set our mark to it and move forward in that same manner in unity. The first one that you can, can, and this is just a, a very, very precise, very pointed command, is that of the Great Commission. We know that the command to the church is to see folks saved, see them baptized, and then once they're baptized, move them to discipleship, to grow in the things of God. And Mark says like this, it says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In Matthew chapter 28, we find it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so there is the pointed purpose of the church, a very specific, united goal that we need to uphold. We need to be ones that take that commission very seriously. Not just getting them saved, but striving to encourage them towards baptism, towards taking that proper step. The next step in the order of your salvation is to show God that you are willing to be obedient by doing the first step that he has. And that's simply to act out what he had done for you. Salvation is a free gift. All we do is, in a picture, act out what happened. The death, burial, and resurrection of God. And it's simply a command that God gives as a stepping stone to many commands that you will hopefully obey in the future. And that's why we need to encourage people to that. In my own experience, I found that, that while I did know lots of Bible, while I did um, have an understanding of scriptures, I was saved. I spent like a year and a half or so just kind of out on my own thinking that, you know, one time when I stood in a rainstorm, that's good enough as my baptism, all sorts of crazy thoughts. But it wasn't until I got into an independent Baptist church, was baptized scripturally, that I started to really notice leaps and bounds happen in my life. Well, why is that? Because God is not going to trust us with the big things in life, like, hey, quitting smoking, quitting drinking, quitting this and that, and all the other things. He's not going to challenge us with those things. If we can't do something very simple, like get dunked underwater. Right? Doesn't that make sense that God's going to wait for you to take that first little baby step, like we did with Caleb, before we're going to expect him to run, before we're going to challenge him to run and encourage him in that direction? We need to be faithful to do the little things before we can be trusted in much. And after that, we get people baptized. Discipleship is the next thing. And this is equally challenging. It's to encourage people not just to be saved and baptized, but encourage them in the steps that follow. To be in church, to be tithing, to be reading their Bible, to be to be loving the brethren, to do all these things that the Bible outlines as, as proper ordered steps for Christians to do, that, that we should do, is what the Bible refers to. We should keep these good works. It's encouraging people towards that. So what do you do in discipleship? Well, you open the Bible up to them, and while they are saved and while they're all baptized, just encourage them in other things of the Lord. You know, it was, it was a long time before I on my own had realized and read the entirety of scriptures. And that's why perhaps my growth was a little bit hindered. Had I got into the good church right away, I would have probably grown a lot faster. Maybe some of that those early years wouldn't have been such vanity in my life. I wouldn't have been so, so confused and mixed up on all sorts of weird doctrines from the internet and things. So that's why it's important that as a church, our united goal is to get people saved, baptized, and discipled as the Bible commands. The next you'll read in Ecclesiastes, the very end of it all. And this is perhaps a little bit more broad. This is maybe falling into that discipleship category a little bit. A little bit. It says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So if we are united in that goal, what great things could God do? If our goal as a church was to fear God and keep his commandments, he would do great things in our lives as individuals. He'd also do wondrous things as us as we came together with that same common mindset and worked together and strived in that area. To fear God above all things, to keep his commandments. Don't be afraid of what life throws at us. Don't be afraid of our neighbor. Don't be afraid of our boss. Don't be afraid of the police. Don't be afraid of the government. But fear God above all things. That's what the world tries to hold over top of people is their fear. 
Satan's going to first attack you and try to get you fearful because anything that is not everything that is of fear is not of faith, right? You can only act in one of those two realms. So if you are fearful of anything but God, you're automatically crippled in the Christian life. So we need to have our focus and our united goal that we would fear God above all things and use that godly fear, that godly reverence to keep his commandments, to love him, to show our love for him by obeying what he desires us to. And that, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, if you want to look it up later, it says, is the whole duty of men. Not just believers, but if believers could get a hold of that and find out what our whole duty is, perhaps then we would really see some great things happen on this side of heaven. But in a more general sense, and if you want, you can turn to Revelation in chapter 4. In a more general sense, yes, Christians should... Sorry, in a wide sense, our, our focus, our, our desire needs to be on keeping the Great Commission as a church. Uh, a little bit more expanded of a general um, idea is to fear God and keep His commandments. If you look at Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, I think this typifies exactly what the purpose of not just the church, which is to upheed the Great Commission, not just the believer, which is to fear God and keep His commandments. This is beyond even that, and this transcends all of those things because this is the whole purpose, the whole reason for which man was even created. And I believe that if we fall into unity in this common goal, again, great things will happen. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11 says this, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. The purpose of all of God's creation, and that includes us, is to please and glorify God. The only reason that God even conceived in his mind to create men was that they would please him. And he thought the same thing when he created the birds of the sea, the fowls of the air, the earth itself, the waters of the earth. Everything was created for the pleasure of God. So as a church, a united goal in the broadest general sense is we need to desire above all things to please and to glorify God. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means everything that we just talked about. That's kind of like, that's kind of like the, the tip of the iceberg to everything else in the Christian life, which is to fear Him and keep His commandments, which is to have the Great Commission, which is to do all things according to His will, according to what the Bible says. That is our purpose, is to please Him, to glorify Him, to lift Him up, and do righteousness before Him because of it. The next thing that I believe we need to do to have unity within the Christian life, within this church, first we talked about was to have a united goal. Please God, glorify God should be our united goal above all things. Love one another is number two. Love one another. You can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it talks about this. It talks about love. It talks about the greatest of love, which is the selfless, selfless act of charity. We've learned much about loving brethren in the past few weeks. Now, this was one of the commands that was from the beginning in, in the Gospel of 1 John, um, or in the, the letter of 1 John. And I believe John knew it best because John spent much of his time, we see recorded in the Scriptures, that he was the beloved. He was one that was very close with Jesus. We often see him leaning upon Jesus' breast. You know, Jesus has his arm around John. He's spending time with him. And so John, in that time... He knew the heartbeat of God. He knew what God desired above all things. And so John became a man that was, was great in preaching the love of God and what that means. And so we see that that was a command from the beginning. We see, I believe, its, its purpose is to bring unity, that we would extend love one toward another, and that would unite us, the commonality. By this shall all men know that you are disciples, by your love one for another, right? This is one of the tells of the believer is that they have love for the brethren. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4, it says, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity wanteth, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. 
And this is an attribute of our unity. This is something that will draw us closer to being united, is if we have this selfless love, this charity that is unwavering, that never ends. Look, we see that charity in just a few points is patient, right? It suffereth long. It is long-suffering. It is kind, uh, compassionate. It, it seeks to do good to others. It doesn't envy. It doesn't look at when somebody is li lifted up, someone who's doing something great as an envious thing. It rejoiceth for that person. Therefore, in contrast, it is not vaunted up. It does not vaunt itself up, not puffed up, right? There's no unseemly behavior. It doesn't seek to please self. Charity is the act, action of love. It acts out what love embodies and shows it to the recipient. And charity is, is a wonderful thing that God has given for men to act out because it's a character of God so that the bond of unity can be present within his congregation, within his church. Now, all of these other things will fall away, the Bible says. You know, if it's, whether it's tongues or whether it's uh, knowledge, it vanishes away. Even prophecy will have no need. But charity never faileth. And to be a Christian and not have charity is to have nothing at all. If you look right above that text in verse 3, it says, And though I bestow my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profits me nothing. The apostle here is explaining that even if I was the greatest Christian in the world, you just looked at me and I have, I've got all these great salvation stories, I'm doing all these great things for the church, I'm always helping out, I'm always tithing, all the outward shows, and yet if I don't have charity, it profiteth me nothing. In other words, if I don't have the proper love behind my actions, then there it is of no value to me, it profiteth me nothing. Therefore, it's showing you that the sincerity of your love will bring unity to not only the actions that you show, but to bring unity unto you within the congregation and amongst your brethren. Charity is supposed to be something that is received by others. Charity is supposed to be something that, that is exhibited within the heart of a believer and shown forth to help them to experience the love that you have for them. It's the action that's associated with the love. And unity takes that charity and the underlying message of charity, which is selflessness, and brings them together. For without unity, or for without selflessness, you can't have unity. And that, this is where I said that there is a sacrifice that needs to be made. That anointing oil needs to be poured out. You are giving something that is of much value. And what's of much value here in this context? It's your charity. It's your love. It's any devotion to self. It's any self-worth, essentially. You are taking it and setting it below that of another person and selflessly exhibiting love to them. Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, there's a few books to the right in your Bible, a few books to the right. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2 exhorts the believer to unity and to humility. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1 says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love... If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. So we see here that the idea is set forth that there is a same love, there is a singular accord, and there is a singular mind that is being exhorted here in Christ and in the fellowship of the Spirit and what that actually entails. So that like, same, singular mind, well, how does that come to be? How in the world would many people from many different cultures, from many walks of life, social standards, uh, things that they love, things they grew up with, things that they care about, how can all these people with so many differences dwell in unity, be like-minded, be of one accord, be of one mind? fulfilled in the joy of Christ, well, that's the key, is that they need to be in Christ, fellowshipping in the Spirit. And that's where unity comes from, because we are united not by our world, uh, what the world raised us to be. We're not united by our hobbies, by, by the things of this, this carnal life. We're united by the fact that we have the same Father, that we have the same Spirit dwelling within us. 
verse 3 it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We're to esteem others better, and that's pretty much contrary to what the world teaches. The world teaches dog eat dog, you know, get ahead, you know, you're, you're, you're the master of your own destiny, all these kinds of do it your own way. You know, Nike says, just do it, right? It's always appropriating self to what should be our motivation. But here it says we're not to think on our own things, we're not to esteem our own selves better than that of others. And this is where unity comes in is because unity takes self and puts it on the side. It puts others in a higher portion, in a higher position of esteem. Don't regard your own things. What does that mean? Don't regard your own needs, your own wants, your own concerns, your own circumstances, and your own hurts. Everything about you that you're going through, don't esteem that as if that's more important than what someone else is going through and is experiencing. That takes a lot of humility because we all have pains and hurts and trials and struggles and trials and temptations. There's all sorts of things that we're going through. But if we're to dwell in unity, if we're to have that singleness of mind, we need to have the mind of Christ within us. And the mind of Christ was always Christ second. He always thought about others. He always thought about the benefit, the help the concerns, the hurts of others in order that they would be lifted up. The whole purpose of him being lifted up on the cross wasn't his idea. It wasn't his idea to be lifted up, right? But the world did that to him as a show. Putting him before everybody between heaven and earth was in order that he would die and be humiliated, though he was the humblest man himself. And the end of that and the reason for that was that he could save the lost. He could save those that he put before himself. Christ didn't enjoy going to the cross, but he went to the cross to the end that the sinner could be saved. And so we in the same way may not enjoy some of the things that we're going through, but for the benefit of another sinner who we are fellowshipping with, who has the same spirit as us, who has the same father of us, we should put ourselves second, essentially take upon ourselves that cross. Hey, let somebody else be esteemed better than you while you are humble, while you are essentially holding that same mind of Christ. And that's what it talks about in the very next verse. Verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And that is the mind of one that is able to dwell in unity. They would have the mind of Christ, and though they may be found in a fashion that is greater than one of their brethren in the world standards, they became humble and obedient unto, maybe not death, but unto maybe shame, unto a forwardness, unto whatsoever your cross is to bear. You lift others up, place yourself down, and become obedient in that position. And in the end, verse 9, wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. We're not going to have that name above every name. But you see here that, that type shown whereby our humility will eventually bring exaltation when we stand before God. And that is essentially how unity comes to be. It comes with self-sacrifice. It comes with being humble and being obedient in our lives. Why? Because obedience is the vehicle by which God can use anybody. He can use our, our, our spirit to do his will. Humility puts us in that position whereby we accept what God wants us to be. And that self-sacrifice is what takes that person. And though I'm being obedient to God... And I may be going through some things that I'd really like to vent and have them help me with. I'm going to lift up the other person's cares before mine own. And that way, if everybody is constantly trying to lift the other up, we're all being lifted up in the same general direction. And the unity of the Spirit is one that gets us all closer to God because nobody is essentially being, being a dead weight to the church. We're all on the up and up because we're lifting one another up. We're helping one another the first way that we can have unity within the church is to be united with a common goal. Please and glorify 
God. The second way that we can have unity in the church is to love one another. Esteem other better than yourself. Lift up other people, though sometimes you may need lifting up. Do your best to lift others up and just wait and hope and pray that your brother beside you is going to lift you up. Essentially, what's, that, what's happening when you're doing that is you're not lifting yourself up. Because when we lift ourselves up, that's an area and a point of pride. And pride cometh for, for destruction and a high spirit before a fall. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The next way that Christians in a church can dwell in unity is don't be divided. <laughs> that, does, that makes sense, right? We need to be united and not divided. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 18 reads this. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So wherever you find division, you're going to find heresy. They're, those two just go together. Heresies bring division. We know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So that little leaven of heresy can cause great divisions within the body. And if we're to dwell in unity, we need to be united and not divided. In other words, we need to be firm and focused on what we believe doctrinally and not allow heresies to divide, to divide us. Heresies need to go. If we're found out that there is heresy among us, we know that there's a sickness among us, and it's called leaven. It's a yeast that will multiply and multiply and multiply until it eventually takes over. Amos chapter 3 and verse 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. If we're not in unity, if we're not in agreement, the further we walk together down the road, the more we're going to get parted. We're going to eventually find reasons why we do not Walk, need to walk together. Why we cannot fitly walk together any further. And it's the same way within a church. If we're not agreed as a body upon the principal doctrines of the church, then we are going to eventually walk our separate ways. And this is how church splits happen. And they don't usually happen where you're just walking in union and suddenly you're like, you know what, we don't agree. You just part ways very peaceably. No, it usually comes to a boiling point where it's anger, it's fear, it's it's, it's, it's just aggression one toward another. And it's always a violent split, and there's always people that are innocent, perhaps, to the heresies and the confusion that's going upon, but nevertheless, they are hurt because of it. Heresies need to go. They need to be removed. But that being said, and, 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 and what we see here is that, yes, some division is good because we need to all be united. So if there's somebody who would cause division because of the heresy, they need to be removed. We need to understand that there is also kind of this tipping point. There is people that carry heresies that aren't necessarily wolves. Does this make sense? <clears throat> there are people, principally newborn believers, that have all sorts of ideas and mentalities that they've brought with them from the world. All sorts of concepts that they thought were right. And we need the Bible to enter and the Word of God to wash and cleanse them in order that they would be made right. What I'm saying here is that there are many heresies that aren't being willingly and purposely promoted. Simply somebody just holds them. But I wouldn't necessarily look at somebody as like the evangelist wolf where they're coming in and they're actually trying to cause division purposely. Though there may be heresies. Regardless of that fact, though there are some dwindling ones that, that may be... <clears throat> they're not purposely holding them. They're not using them for malicious intents. Um, quite often, like I said, it's young and unlearned folks that carry certain heresies, that carry certain teachings and doctrine and baggage from the past. Though they're not purposely hurting and causing division, they are hurting and causing division. Okay? So this is why I said the third point of the commission is so important because as we bring in saved people and get them baptized, we need to disciple those strange beliefs out of their minds, out of their hearts. We do that by discipling with the Word of God. And if we don't do that, then that little leaven, though it is innocent at the time because it's not somebody that's puffed up with this knowledge and then trying to spread it around and trying to mix people up on bad doctrine, uh, that seed is planted in them and, and can eventually blossom to that. So these little um, <clears throat> heresies 
that somebody might, might believe and bring with their false religion that they used to be a part of, or may believe and bring with them about their humanistic uh, mindset, all sorts of things, right? That you learn as you grow as a Christian. We need to be faithful and, and, and firm and fast to get these believers taught up in these things so that when they're in the church we can be in unity because we're getting newborn babes in Christ and even young ones up to speed on what the united doctrine of the church is and therefore we dispel any potential of division being caused down the road we are still to seek out heresies and when we hear of them or we find out about them just take somebody politely and we can do it when they're in that humble state and just say hey look what the Bible says I'm not sure you considered this but I, I think what you believe and what you're telling me is, is incorrect according to the scripture what do you think and quite often people are like whoa I didn't even know the Bible said that I, I hear that all the time I heard that all the time in my Christian life when I was a newborn babe I was like I didn't even know that was a sin and it threw me off but I got it right and that should be the general bent and the general mentality of us we need to be united and not divided and heresies will divide us <clears throat> one both heresy both acts of heresy need to go the one you know violently get out of here if you're going to evangelize that garbage the second hey can can i help you straighten something out with your doctrine there's two different ways of approaching it either way we need to get it out because if there's divisions there's heresies the apostle paul says that clear there must also be heresies among you because I see that there are divisions among you. Go forward in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Chapter 4. Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, <clears throat> chapter 4. Ephesians 4 and verse 1 talks about how to keep the unity within the body. Ephesians 4 verse 1, I therefore... The prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. In other words, you have been called, you have been saved, and I am beseeching, encouraging you that you would walk worthy of such a salvation. Well, how do you do that? With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So this is something that when we're walking worthy, we're endeavoring to do. We're endeavoring to keep the unity within the spirit. In other words, if we all got the same spirit abiding with us, we should be united in that commonality of the spirit, the bond of peace, the Bible calls it. We do that by acting lowly, by acting meek, by acting long-suffering with one another, by forbearing one another in love. As that newborn babe comes in, as the person that's a little bit less learned in certain areas of the doctrine, you give them opportunity to grow. You extend that worthy walk to them, whereby you're essentially just, just lower, meeker, being humble, helping them along the way, and doing what you can to keep. We need to endeavor to keep that unity of the spirit and that bond of peace verse 4 says this there is one body and one spirit even as you are called in one hope of your calling one lord one faith one baptism one god and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all so he just said this he said we need to keep the unity we need to be united and then he goes on to explain in verse 4, 5, and 6 that there is one body, there is one spirit, there is one hope of your calling, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. We're to exhibit the one that is God. And this isn't oneness. We're exhibiting the one that is the body of Christ, that is the spirit, that is the Lord, that is the faith, that is the baptism. If there's ever oneness, it's the entirety of the package. It's God, the Father of all. It's Christ in him. It's his body as he planted it upon the church. It's the singular faith that gets someone saved in his walk. It's the one singular baptism that is correct. It's the one body that is the church united, not here, but in glory. There is oneness in the purpose of God here, as explained to the Ephesians in chapter 4. And he's saying we need to walk worthy of that same vocation wherewith we are called. Now all that one, 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 one is that vocation wherewith we are called unto. We've got to do it with humility. We've got to do it with long suffering, one toward another. Why? Because it looks what it says in verse 7. It says, but to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. What I think this portion of scripture is highlighting is the fact that we have met people and we've gotten them saved by faith in Christ alone, by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ.
They are, they are saved by grace through faith. There's nothing that they can do to lose it. They believe all the truths, the main points of the gospel they receive. They call upon the Lord for salvation. And yet they might think that when I was baptized as a Lutheran, that's probably good enough. Does that make sense? There's somebody that may need a little bit of growth in that area, though they are saved. Hey, there is one baptism. But maybe there's somebody in the church that doesn't believe that. Okay? That's where verse 7 comes in. Every one of us was given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. We were born again. We were extended grace to save us. We are extended grace to grow in. And I believe that Christians in lowliness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, need to extend that same grace unto others who may not have the understanding of the spiritual truths that are being highlighted there. The vocation that we were called to is perhaps confusing to them. Perhaps they don't get all the finer points. This is why the believer that has been grown in these things needs to endeavor to keep that unity in the spirit by teaching one another, by helping one another, by encouraging one another to the point where they, yeah, there's one body, there's one spirit. They can check off this list with complete understanding of all the doctrines that fall underneath it. God extended that grace to you whereby you could grow. We need to extend that same grace to others. Again, heresies that are purposely pushed are going to go. There's going to be no mercy unto those. But heresies that are just understood and somebody's mind is, has been clouded by things they thought of the past, we can give grace to those situations till we get you to the point where you understand, till we reach that fullness and that point. That's what it says in verse 7. It highlights that grace. Verse 8 says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it that he also descended first from the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascendeth up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So, now he's talked about endeavoring to keep the unity, the bond of the Spirit, extending grace to those that are saved and may not have full understanding of holiness, of truths, of, of what, what it means to have one faith, one baptism, all of those highlighted truths within the Scripture. But God doesn't just say, hey, figure out how to get there. He, he actually provides the gifts and the means of getting to it. Verse 7 points that out. Continues down after the parentheses in verse 11. He says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. He's saying here that there was something lacking. The person needs needs uh, to walk worthy. We need to endeavor to keep that unity by cleansing the false doctrines that come in of not understanding the ones, the ones, the ones, the main truths of the Bible. There where God gave us gifts and to encourage those gifts and to promote those gifts and to pro preach those gifts and to push those gifts and to perfect the saints. He gave all these ministering men and these ministering workers in order to what? Edify the body of Christ. In order to what? Perform the work of the ministry. And that is to be the purpose and the plan of extending the gospel ministry. The unity that is not divided is that there would be growth in all of these areas. Till we all come to that unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to that perfect man, that singular perfect man. We've reached the stature and fullness of Christ. None of us have arrived there and until we're perfect we can't say so. But then it says that we henceforth. So this is what is happening currently. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. The current position is that if you're outside the church, if you're outside the ministry of all of these ministers that were listed, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, if you're outside of that, you will be tossed to and fro. You will be carried about in the wind. But the safety net is the fact that you're within the body where everybody is endeavoring to keep the unity, to promote everybody to that unity of the faith, to the understanding of the knowledge of the Son of God, to bring them to the perfect man, which will only come by the grace of God, to bring them closer to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ in order to protect and to guard those that might be tossed about 
carried about with every wind of false doctrine. This is your safety net, the church. This is your help, the church. And God provides a way whereby with long suffering and lowliness and meekness, those that are instructed in the truths of the scriptures can give the same gift that God gave unto them, extending grace and helping them to grow in these areas. How do we do it? Verse 15, speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. When we extend love, preach the truth in love, we are able to bring those and grow them up into the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. This is discipleship. This is the third tier of the Great Commission. Again, there's not going to be truth and love extended to the wolf that comes in and tries to evangelize wicked heresies. Yeah, get out, right? There's no, there's no need for extending love in that situation. But the one that is growing, the one that was recently saved, the one that desires perfecting, needs to have some perfecters, some people that can help them, minister them, lift them up into the things of God so that we can all be united. Churches to unite believers within a group that is directed unto growth. That's what it says in verse 15. It says, speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things. We are to have this as a fertile ground whereby we can cultivate people that are growing up unto Christ. And that is our action as the body of Christ. That is our purpose as the body of Christ. When you are in, you are growing. When you are half in, half out, who knows what you're doing. When you're here sometimes and you're, you're not here other times. When you're here late and when you're, when, you're, when you're leaving early. All sorts of things that can hinder that growth and actually being part of the body. When the body's assembled, everything's here. We use that illustration often. How upset would you be if you woke up and your right foot just decided not to show up in the morning, right? You're going to fall on your face. And that's how the body works, right? It's an illustration of the fact that every portion, every member is purposeful in particular and needful to the whole. Verse 16 says, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. It's a very... Um, uh, maybe confusing way of reading it, but if you look, you'll see the body highlighted there twice as a singular. But then it talks about joined together and compacted by every joint according to the measure of every part. What it's saying here is that every part of the body is to come in and fulfill what the whole is to the end that the increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love is the result. The body is to edify and encourage itself. You notice sometimes when you sprain your ankle, sometimes your knee will start hurting. Why? Because you're walking a little bit different on that ankle, and that knee is compensating for it. Now, if that knee just decided not to show up, suddenly your hip is carrying some of the weight. Your back's starting to bear some of that pain. Your whole body is fitly joined together, compacted together to the purpose that it would be effectually working together Unto the edifying of self and love is the, where the illustration falls flat and just encourages the church aspect of it. The body forms a whole of many members. And every member is important in particular, even those that are less comely. So we as believers need to be united and not divided within the whole body. And the purpose is that you would grow and grow and grow. Nobody wants to stay a baby forever. We want to grow and grow and grow. And the church is no different. We want to be a baby church forever. We want to grow and grow and grow. And the only way we're going to grow is if we are joined, fitly, together, compacted, every joint supplying, effectually the needs of the other members within it, that we may edify itself in love. A key point found here is that the edifying of itself is what's happening. Now there's all different ways that we can get edification, right? We can listen to sermons, we can read books, we can uh, speak about things with our families, we can do all sorts of things to be edified, but the edifying of itself being the body is supposed to be primarily done by the body itself. Together is where most of the edification should happen. And that happens to all of us, before a service, mid-service, after service. I hope I have some part of the edifying. But that's, that's the result of a church congregation being together, is the edifying of itself. 
encouraging of itself, lifting up of itself until it comes to that perfect stature of the fullness of Christ as individuals within that body. And as we grow, we need to remember things like some people differ. We need to administer grace to people where somebody isn't as far along in the Christian walk as you. Why? Because I recognize that I haven't arrived and there's going to be someone more grown than me that's going to teach me something that I don't know yet. And so when I look down upon a babe in Christ and go, what do you mean you don't have that figured out yet? It's the wrong attitude. We need to remember there are people that are growing. There are people that are different. Times, times and backgrounds, all sorts of different ways that people can be different one from another. And we need to administer grace primarily. Some ways that we can differ, the timing of the rapture. Historical interpretations, like, like when we read a history book, we all have different perspectives depending on what our, what our background is, right? Politics, there, there's something that many can fight over, right? Politics, schooling or raising children, medical methods, all sorts of things that we can differ in and yet still administer grace unto one another. How about this, diet, holidays. Romans chapter 14 is the last place I'm going to go. Romans chapter 14 is a specific example of where there's difference among believers and yet they can be united and not divided because it's not a division caused by a very false heresy, right? You can let some things go. You can wink at some differences. Romans chapter 14 says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let, him, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up. For God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. That let idea. Let him be fully persuaded in his own mind. The context here is receiving the weak. So if you receive a weak believer into the church and they have a different understanding in them, receive them, but not to doubtfully dispute them, not to argue with them, not to make them right, not to despise them and say, whoa, 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 whoa you're way off in this. Know you to receive them in order to help them. And when you fo both fully come to the point where you are persuaded in your own minds in areas that don't have anything to do with pure doctrine that are a unified position of the church, then you can both agree to disagree and let this one think that it's good to celebrate this holiday. And this one to think that I just esteem every day alike and don't celebrate any holiday. But they can both still dwell in unity without having to divide over those things. So remember, as people grow, that we can administer grace to them. And they can be helped, and they can heal, and they can grow in those things without having full disputation among them. Verse 6 says, He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. And that's the bottom line, is that, is that if we're all believers, and we're all saved, and we all... Um, have different mindsets about things and we believe that the Lord has led us in that way and there's differences in opinions in minor areas, we can still dwell together in unity. Why? Because we are both doing it from the position that we are the Lord's. The Lord is going to judge me. The Lord is going to be the one that upholds me. Who are we to always judge the other man in areas that have no biblical consequence? We see this all the time where a church will split over the, the color of carpet that they picked. It happens all the time. The church will split over hiring a new pianist. The church will split because, because uh, they, they got new curtains. This, this stuff happens all the time. And these are all minors, and these are not important points of doctrine. One man esteemeth this holy day. The other man says all days are alike. They can dwell together in unity. The Bible is clear here. The Bible says that no man is an island unto themselves. No, the Bible didn't say that. I said that. No man is an island to himself. Verse 7 plays into that picture. It says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. What that is saying is that we aren't our own 
in a vacuum whereby we don't affect others that are around me. Whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Either way, we're Lord's. We're part of his body. We're part of this, um, this uh, area that he has, this, this position that he has is placed in within this body. But we're not an island whereby our actions are going to affect others. So what does God command in these areas whereby we see differences one with another? First it says in verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother, and why dost thou set at not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now the one that is strong in the faith could go at the one with doubtful disputations. He could push him down. He could despise him. And that would be one that is judging his brother and setting his brother or not. But what he is missing when he receives the weak and then just disputes with him about the fact that he's a vegetarian, he is falling short of the realization that he too will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Don't judge or push down your brethren. Otherwise, it says in verse 11, For it is written, I say, Live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. If you are going to judge, you will be judged in the same fashion when you stand before God. So don't set it not your brother. Receive them. Help them grow, as we saw in Ephesians chapter 4. Be patient, long-suffering with people as they come up. Yes, we need to be watchful of heresies as they enter in and can destroy a church. But we also need to be gracious with one another in areas that don't have a clear biblical precedent whereby you could say, Thus saith the Lord, that is sinful, brother. Right? We need to have that balance of understanding, hey, I was at that point at one point, and now I'm here, and there's someone much more grown than I that could look down upon me and judge me in the same way. And above all of that is God who will ask for an account. <clears throat> Verse 13 says, let us, therefore, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, but no man put a stumbling block or occasion to fall before his brother. Verse 19 says, let us therefore follow after things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. We need to be watchful of our own stumbling block placement. We have to give patience to those that are growing. We've got to give grace to those that are grown. We need to gently instruct those that oppose themselves in the minors and in the majors, depending on their walk. If somebody is confused about something that we think is a major, and yet they're, they're not here willingly evangelizing and trying to circumvent and supplant the church, we can still be gracious with that person, gently instruct those, and then after one, after two admonitions, then reject them. Christians need to be defaulted to a, a, a mindset of unity. We need to be drawn together with believers and not always be on a bench to constantly divide and constantly separate and drive hard lines in every area. Yeah, we're not going to budge on the King James Bible. Yeah, we're not going to budge on grace through faith. But I don't give a rip how you interpret the Civil War. I'm not going to fight you upon that. I'm not, I'm not going to fight you on holidays. Whether you think that Christmas is okay and Easter is okay, but another person just, just doesn't. I don't celebrate any of them. They both are the Lord's. They're both willingly seeking after God, and that needs to be the precedent. What did we learn today about unity? That we need to be united and not divided. There's a time for division. It's appropriate when somebody is willingly preaching damnable heresies or things that cause confusion or they're relentless about minors that have nothing to do with the church or if they're in here trying to sell some things, right? Covetous, proud, blessed. There's all sorts of things whereby the church is given legal authority per the Bible to remove somebody from the congregation. That's not the, that's not the division I'm talking about. We need to be divided in those areas. But that can't be our bent. We need to push towards unity. The next thing that we see is we love one another. And that love will draw unity together amongst the brethren. And finally, have a united goal. We already talked about it. Our first and foremost goal needs to be pleasing, to be pleasing and glorifying unto God above all things. And if we do these three things, and I'm sure there are many more, if we do these things and we focus our minds and our hearts on being the humble servant of Christ above all things, bringing him glory, teaching others, helping through the commission, being divisive in the right fashion, then this church will grow. It will grow stronger and it will be united and it will be just like that anointing oil that fell down to the skirt of Aaron's garments. It will be just like that dew that came down and gave sustenance unto the people of Israel as they were. Those types will come to their fruition. 
once we get a hold of these truths so that unity in the church and start to act upon them. Thank you, Father, for this day and for this opportunity that we've had, Lord. I pray, God, that you'd be with us.